Deborah Lee Baldwin has really taken succulents from kind of a few collectors and curiosities. The beginning of it was her first book, um, which is Designing with Succulents. And uh, hopefully all of you have that. Um, but if not, the exciting news is a new edition is coming out this fall. And I just hope you have a great time. You've got one of the greatest speakers we have here. So oh. Deborah Lee Baldwin. Oh. <laughs> Nobody, but nobody, gives an introduction like Ron Vanderhoff. <laughs> Thank you, Ron. No. When I got here today, just an hour ago, oh. I hit the ground running. And the first place I went was not to the nursery stock with the succulents, because I'm fairly familiar with what they have here. I made a beeline for the indoor retail, because that's where all the pretty seasonal stuff is. All the eye candy design stuff that we sigh over. Today I could have anything I wanted. <laughs> so <clears throat> keeping in mind that it had to go with the theme of succulents. You're here because I'm known for designing with succulents. I wrote a book, Succulent Container Gardens. The succulents are my shtick. And that's what you expect from me. So what did I find that I thought would combine well with succulents? Well, you probably already guessed. Sea themed summer-themed containers and items. Because what I'm seeing in the colors of the shells are also in the colors of the succulents, or they work really well with them. This sort of a peachy color goes so well with the pale blues in the succulents. So if you did, you did nothing but pair those two, you'd have an element in your themed display for your outdoor patio. And the two colors, the pale peach and the pale blue-gray are on opposite sides of the color wheel, which is very pleasing. They're complementary pastels. I saw this big shell, and it's not, of course, a real shell, but how could I say no after deciding on my theme, right? <laughs> okay, so I kind of have signed up for this, so I'm going to plant this in a minute, but before I do that, like, look at this Sedum nisbomerianum. Look at how pretty that is. So if you did nothing else but, you know, put this on the wall maybe with just a pot in front of it with some of the yellow seed in it, you'd have a pretty display. And I went into the floral shop over here. You've been in there, I know. Another place to get great ideas. And I saw these driftwood arrangements. Well, what I love about these is they're not real. <laughs> I mean, you could let your cat chew on them. You could let your grandchildren run over them with their tricycles. You could hold them upside down, and they're perfectly fine, and they need no water. What, what would we put in these barnacles? I'm going to pull the tag off, because I can. <laughs> well, now this lends itself to cuttings of succulents. You could just take a plant like this and pinch it apart and stick the cuttings in, kind of wedge them in there. Now, th th we're talking about a temporary display. If you want these to actually grow in here, you would add soil first. But how long do you think these cuttings are going to stay in those openings? Just like that? Somebody said not long. Quite a while. So that's the wonder and the beauty of succulents, is how they will live off the moisture in their leaves. By definition, succulents are plants that withstand periods of drought by storing water in fleshy leaves and stems. That means that sometimes in their native habitat, it goes dry for so long that they lose their roots. And when the rains come, they regrow them. So for a succulent to be decapitated like this, which looks really brutal, uh, and stuffed into a sharp little hole, <laughs> and then be expected to look good for an extended period of time is nothing to the succulent. In fact, when you're tired of your summer display and you're, you start shopping Rogers for all that uh, fall and weird Halloween stuff they have, or creative Halloween stuff, uh, these will probably have little roots that have formed at the base of the cutting. Look at that. I did that in, what, a minute? And we've got a sweet little display. The conventional way to plant barnacles if you've noticed, if you're on Pinterest and social media, is with Tillandsias, air plants. You know that they're not succulents, right? Tillandsias do not have fleshy 
leaves. They do not store moisture in their leaves to withstand periods of drought. They will work in a composition with the succulent. Uh, they're going to need to be misted. But so there you have those options. You could do you could do some barnacles with your patio uh, display and plant them with all sorts of things. You, you just wonder if you know if God has a sense of humor because these are really dry plants and yet they look like they live in water. The flowers on cactus look like water lilies. Have you ever noticed? Let's talk about some of the actual plants that we have here to play with that sort of suggest undersea creatures. We have, oh, the sticks on fire. Can't you imagine snorkeling past that? Some kind of a coral and the um, cotyledon. Looks like something you'd see in a reef. One of the Medusa euphorbias, Euphorbia flanaganii. Doesn't it look like it could just crawl out of that pot? It's just begging to be used in a seashell arrangement either way. But what you don't want is something that says cactus. Okay, that's just gonna be jarring and discordant. So I moved all of the barrel cactus that Rogers had thoughtfully provided in the display way over there, don't lean back, that when we pick our most dramatic plant for this arrangement, we have committed to a certain color scheme. So that this is a must, and that gives us a green, okay? So we're now in the greens. We're in the greens, the yellow greens, and maybe with a little bit of orange, so I think we're pretty much committed that if we have to have Euphorbia flanaganii or a Medusa form Euphorbia, then we might as well go with the upright sticks on fire. Calanchoe lucie, fantastic. Great little name. We have to have starfish. Now this doesn't look like a starfish, does it? But if you, if you take it and you cut it, it does. So how am I going to do this, right? Because the leaves overlap so tightly. Okay, here's my cutting. Now you'll see that there's like a little collar. And look at that. You can see right through it. Isn't that fascinating? That's a perfect circle. Isn't nature amazing? But you've got to allow this to have a place from which roots will form. So take a few more of those little leaf collars off. These are useless. They're not going to root. They're not good for anything. Because you want to expose meristem tissue. Now this is nice and firm. That doesn't want to come off. And I've, I've exposed the meristem tissue around that. So now I have a good cutting. And I also have a starfish. Okay. So what do we know about this plant? We know that it is a euphorbia. And it has a milky sap that you have to be careful of, right? Uh -huh. You're aware of that? Very, yeah. There's been more and more reports of people going to the hospital because they've gotten a sap of euphorbias in their eyes. Can you name a very popular euphorbia? It's a very large genus that is not a succulent that you have in your homes seasonally every year? <laughs> Poinsettia. Yeah. So how do you tell if something is a euphorbia? Well, you break a leaf. And if you see a milky sap, that's probably euphorbia. And you want to be very careful not to get that in your eye. You can buy cactus mix. It's fine. Uh, personally, because I have a large garden and I like to have bins of stuff, I, I buy regular potting soil and a big bag of pumice, and I mix the two half and half. OK, so always start with your largest plant first. Pumice, P-U-M-I-C-E. To learn more about pumice, go to my website, DebraLeeBaldwin.com, and there is a whole page just about pumice. Are we repurposing and recycling stuff? Because I'm doing a bad job of separating it. Okay. Now, I often, you know, in some of my plotting demos here at Rogers, I have, um, I have actually set a root ball on top of the soil in the pot and then filled in around it to create a mounded arrangement. This not so much, but I do, want, I do want them planted at angles, not necessarily straight up. Obviously, the, you know, the coral is going to go straight up. Hey, they gave me a tablecloth this time that I can get filthy dirty. Good job. Yeah, you just like to make work for yourself. That's fine. I like the shape of this, and I like the contrast. I like the way it repeats the blue in the Kalanchoe, I like the way it repeats the upright nature of the sticks on fire. 
It's not the right green, but I think we're okay with it. And I like the fact that it has some red on the tips. Are you good with it? Or do you see something else here that you like better? You know, we have, we have these. No, this is a Crassula. It's in the jade plant family. Uh, it's cra Crassula argentia, and it is, uh, the, what are you calling it here at Rogers? Pig's ears. Pig's ears? <laughs> Honey, pig's ear is a cotyledon. It's not is this a cotyledon? That's a cotyledon. Yeah, it's very similar to a Crassula. Well, I bow to the, I bow to Ron, wow. Because I was going to say, nurseries almost never carry Crassula argentia because it's glacially slow growing and it gets little little marred places on it. See now, okay, so this is interesting to me. I learned something today. This is a cotyledon, right? And this is a cotyledon. Yeah, okay, let's use this. And what I'm going to do is just, just use the cuttings. I think it'll work really well. Okay, so I have my Joyce Chen scissors. Wouldn't go anywhere without them. They are labeled Deborah. Okay. And look at how that, rep oh, I love that. Whose idea was this? Hi. Yay. <laughs> see, what she, see what she spotted right away, the repetition here? The colors are fantastic together. It, it picks up that little bit of blue inside the Kalanchoe and also repeats the flapjack shape of the leaves. So great choice. And because we're repeating that, I don't know, I kind of like the idea of putting it close to it, but I like it even better farther away. I think it's going to be a wonderful repetition farther away. And since I'm using cuttings, I'm going to need more soil. So let's, let's tuck this in a little bit later on and go down through. I'm still wondering about this. I think, I don't know, this is sort of speaking to me, this cotyledon. I'm kind of thinking that it should go, especially since we're using the second cotyledon that repeats elements of this one, that it wants to go nestled up against that as sort of a repetition. You know, I'm all about repetitions. You notice I use the word a lot. And one thing I've learned over the years, in all the designers I've interviewed and all the gardens I've photographed, uh, and you see I just pulled that right apart. Look what's in the middle. There's a broken plant. <laughs> and that's okay because the, uh, the plant is living off its leaves for the most part anyway. Anyway, one thing I've learned that I, I it's just a, a, a go-to is um, contrast and repetition are the two most important design principles. So now we have both in the addition of the cotyledon, but we cannot forget our euphorbia here. And let's just get the dirt from around it. Yes, it does. Yeah, I suspect this one's not real juicy because it, it looks, uh, doesn't look as plump as I've seen them. But since I've already broken one and I'm in danger of getting it on me, I don't think I'm going to do another one. <laughs> okay, so I think that wants to nestle right in there. You notice I did not plant this straight up. It's rotated outward, leaning its chin on the rim of the pot. If you work from large to small, then it gets easier as you go along. You've got your main elements in. You just, you're just working now on uh, repetition and contrast. Oh, look, here's a little baby. Hello there. You want to go live somewhere beside your, right up against your mom? Are your roots milky too? Yep, interesting. Okay. All right. So I want to check this where you can see it because I want that repetition, the eye to see both but not smack up against each other. And then we'll tuck this little guy in toward the end. So how's this looking from your side? Pretty good, okay. And we do have some gaps, uh, which I'll, you know, now, now I'm just filling, basically. I've got my main elements in, my upright sticks on fire. Um, I think I could use maybe a little bit more of that. Yeah, let's tuck some of that in. You know, one thing that's hard for me to do when I'm on stage like this is to get a sense of the proportions. Is the height right? Uh, does it seem oddly too high? Do I need to somehow lower the plant to be more in scale and proportion with the pot? So I'm going to just stand over here and... Oh, that looks good. You know what I love about this? 
and I didn't, I totally did not plan this, but look at how the swirl of the lines in the seashell draw your, up, your, your eye up through the lines in the composition. I should take credit for that, huh? <laughs> she says, yeah, I planned that. Planned that all along. Is it best to plant an arrangement so that it can be viewed from all angles or just from one? And, and I think it's, it's just a matter of where, you, where are you gonna put it? You know, where's, and, and I spend a lot of time, <laughs> way too much time, uh, standing back and looking. You know, when I, when I get a pot and I'm, I'm trying to find out where I wanna put it or a new bird feeder, I, I position it and then I run inside and I look out the window, you know, and then I come out and I move it like two inches. <laughs> and I think the difference between people like me and designers, professional designers who make a living doing that, is that they don't have to do that running around, standing back and looking. They just inherently know when something's in scale and proportion and will look right, the angles, all of that. But the rest of us, it's okay, you know? It's okay to take something back to the store to try stuff on your home, just like you try stuff on yourself in a dressing room. And don't live with your mistakes out of a sense of, of false pride. You know, you go home and you say, I got such a good deal on this. And, and your husband's like, really? <laughs> you know what he's thinking, the store got, got a good deal. Oh, I forgot, I forgot my chopstick. Remember Susan, was it last year? I said, Susan, I need my chopstick. And Susan's like rummaging through my purse looking for chapstick. <laughs> <laughs> so, oh, how'd you do that? <laughs> do you know anybody who walks around with chopsticks in their pocket, unwrapped chopsticks? Thank you, thank you by the way. I will never forget this. It's what? It's a secret. It's a secret, oh, okay. Well, it's not a secret, nothing's a secret anymore here, Ron. All right, so I, I am tucking and just having fun with think where things are going. This nice big fellow needs to, I think, be showcased, maybe right there. A little bit of this I'm doing sort of blind because I'm not doing the stand back and look thing. But uh, I have a sense that I'm on the right track and that it's gonna be hard to mess it up now. Oh, wow, big old leaf came off of that. Yeah, so that's, that's good to know. This is a plant I haven't worked with before, this cotyledon. You know, with these big fleshy succulents, you can just cut them apart and stick them in as cuttings. Why, why worry about the root balls? These, uh, these big leaves, look at that. How long do you think you could live off of that if you were in, a, in the desert? Look how juicy that is. Does that plant need to be watered anytime soon? I, could, I bet I could make it drip if I squeezed it. Yeah. Yeah, look at that. Doesn't that look kind of tasty? You can even like peel it. It looks like, it looks sort of like, um, okay, name, name an edible succulent that looks a lot like this. A edible, edible. Yeah, yeah, uh, nopales. Yeah, nopales which I think have the potential to uh, end world hunger, by the way, because they'll grow anywhere. Don't laugh, it's a crazy idea. But uh, Luther Burbank was working on that. And uh, he even came up with some spineless cultivars of Apuntia that would, would be suitable for cattle feed. And when you think about it, what we feed our cattle now, the grains have to be stored and they have to be watered and there's a lot of labor involved in the harvest, but if you're, if you're using paddle cactus, it'll grow anywhere, just throw the pads on the ground. And that's a good question. Is there any rule about how closely you're going to, uh, to grow these plants? And the rule of thumb is the more tightly packed the arrangement, the more quickly it will deconstruct <laughs> as the plants grow. It's, it's common sense, uh, but I, I ascribe to the Rogers, uh, the, the Rogers aesthetic when I'm at Rogers Gardens, and that is to just pack the living daylights out of stuff, <laughs> because you can. 
I'm wanting a few more starfish, I think. Uh, so, yeah. So, what will happen, especially during the growing season, is that you will uh, find things crowding each other and getting leggy and sticking out too far. And uh, you'll have to trim them back. And hopefully they'll give you cuttings that you can use somewhere else. Okay, so we have another starfish there. I'm sure I have gaps here and there. But I wanted to talk to you too about your handout sheet, which gives a nod to my forthcoming book. Now, Designing with Succulents, which came out in 2007, is credited with launching not just national but worldwide interest in succulents. So I'm very proud of that. And my publisher, Timber Press, decided that they wanted to do a celebratory 10th, uh, 10th anniversary edition, second edition of Designing with Succulents uh, for release this year in 2017, 10 years later. And uh, so I, I revised the book. Now, I thought that that would be pretty simple because I knew that I had done a damn good job on that book. And so how hard could it be? Because it didn't need to be made better. But what I didn't realize is that so much has happened. I mean, I knew that, but I, when I started getting into the manuscript and realizing that there were 10 years worth of phenomenal changes in the world of succulents, I, I, to do it justice, I had to completely rewrite the book. So it, instead of 300 photos in the original edition, this one has 400. Um, and the text is completely redone. The photos are 90% new. I think I kept maybe 10% of the original photos. So I'm calling it a brand new book. It is my magnum opus, my major, my major life's work. And that is coming out at the end of August. You can pre-order it now, and it will be sent straight to you. Please order it through my website because I'm an Amazon associate and I will get a, a tiny percentage but enough to make me feel loved. So other than hosing this off, this needs a good splash. Oh look at how, can you see how that milk has dripped? Wow, this is a juicy one. Look at how the milk, I don't know if you can tell, this, I'm moving the whole table sometimes when I move this, but the, the uh, milk from that, that one little branch that I, I cut has dripped down onto the red leaf of the Kalankoe. It looks beautiful. Thank you. Thank you.